The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then they began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo a great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord of Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> On January 28, 1986, the shuttle Challenger took off from its launch pad and 73 seconds later exploded in the air, killing everyone on board. All of us who can remember that morning remember exactly where we were, remember exactly what we were feeling and the question we asked, what went wrong. And now, 30 plus years later, we know went wrong. What went wrong? It was the, the O-rings. And in one sense, it was, but as it turns out, there's an even deeper problem than that, an even more primary problem than that, that we could argue was the primary cause of this disaster. On January 27th, 1986, it was an exceptionally cold day in Florida, and on the launch pad of the of the, uh, of the Challenger, there were literally icicles more than a foot long, and there's pictures of that that you can find on the internet if you want to see them. Sort of amazing to see how much ice there was. And so Morton Thoracol, the makers of the O-rings, and the O-rings connected the fuel chambers to the rest of the vehicle so that the fuel would not escape and ignite. Uh, they advised NASA that we, 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 they advised them, do not launch. We have significant evidence that uh, that this is going to, that the O-rings are going to fail, and they're going to fail, and this is the word, catastrophically. Well, there was a lot of pressure in this launch. You might remember Christine uh, McCauley was uh, going up on that flight, and the first teacher in space, and President Reagan was going to use that as the, as the basis of his State of the Union uh, speech that night. And so uh, on the evening of, of January 27th, there was a conference call, and 34 people participated in that conference call. And that conference call went on for three hours, and the, o and the only point of that conference call, the whole point was whether or not the O-rings would perform acceptably. And in the course of this conversation, again, the Morton Thoracol engineers said, we do not think they will. It's too cold. Rubber, rubber malforms at these temperatures, and, and, and it's not going to seal the way it's supposed to. And we already have evidence that this has happened before in flights that weren't even this cold. We can see what's called blow-by, and that means that the, the, the O-rings already began to fail, and fuel escaped the outside and ignited and scored the outside of, of earlier uh, shuttles. So they said, we, we really don't think you should do this. And, 
The NASA engineers, is all the pressure on them, and this is again on record, one of the engineers says, my God, and excuse me for using the Lord's name in vain, but this is an exact quote, my God, Thoracall, when do you expect us to launch? April? And so at the end of this three-hour conversation, uh, Morton Thoracall, under duress from NASA, sends them a memo saying, we believe that the parameters of this launch are acceptable and the O-rings will be fine. Next morning, launch. 73 seconds later, Challenger explodes. Everybody on board. Where was the failure? Yes, it was O-rings. But before it was ever the O-rings, it was simply a failure of human communication. The deepest and primary failure was a failure of words. And you may never launch a shuttle, but you will launch something that in its own way is every bit as important. We launch friendship. We launch marriages. We launch children into the world, and we launch ourselves into parenthood. We launch businesses and business projects. We launch churches and ministries within church. And every day, every moment of every day, there are people blowing up all those things with their words. And so when I thought about this sermon and the series we're in is, uh, Jesus is a buttermilk biscuit, come and let him soak you up. And I thought about this, I thought I might have done a teaser for this sermon, put out a little promo to tease a little bit. And in this, I would have, uh, my, my tagline would have been, life is a biscuit, come and blow it up. And I would have put an M80 in a, in a biscuit and then ignited it and blown the biscuit to kingdom come. <laughs> The, word, the, the point being that words are explosive. And then I might have done another little teaser trailer, and in this one, I would have taken a can of gasoline and poured it all over the biscuit, and I would have thrown a match on it and said, life is a biscuit, come and light it up, because words are incendiary. And I'd be willing to bet that every single one of us here, at some point in our lives, has scorched someone we dearly love with our word. This is what James is talking about. James would have agreed with all these things. This is what James said in the reading that we heard from James earlier. James was the brother of Jesus, so he had a good teacher. And this is one of the books of the Bible that he wrote. And I commend this book to you, and I'd love for you to read this book this week. Um, there are books in the Bible that are hard to understand. This is not one of them. There are books in the Bible people disagree with. None of us will disagree with this. He says, the tongue is untamable. It can be an incredibly destructive force. It set things on fire. It blows things up. And so since we don't have to worry about interpreting this properly, and because we all agree with what it says, we're going to spend all our time this morning just on applying it. We're going to look at how we can use our words well. And I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but I'm probably going to remind you, like writing this sermon reminded me, of things we all could use a little jog on. Our memories could use a little jog on that particular thing. So here's the first thing. We're going to start easy. The first thing is don't multitask. When you're communicating with people, don't multitask. Whenever we're communicating, there's the message, the word, and the, and the uh, meta message, and that's, and that's the larger message that we're communicating. So words are only a small part of what we communicate, body language, tone, speed, in, in, intonation, all those things are, are, are the major part of, of communicating what we're really saying. That's the meta message. So if we're talking to somebody and we're doing something else, the, the meta message is, you're not really important to me. That doesn't promote good communication. So at least on occasions, turn off the devices, put them away. Dinner tables should be device-free places. Uh, meetings, I mean, I, I understand why people, but I mean, so many meetings, I just watch people be distracted because, you know, put the devices away. And even in our own personal lives, I, I think we'd be wise to have spaces in our own personal lives where we just turn our devices off, put them aside, and in silence, listen for the voice of God, or if we don't believe in God, listen to our own voice, our conscience telling us what we should or should not do for the course of the day. Don't multitask, put those devices away. <coughs> Second, um, is when we communicate, ask ourselves whether we want to communicate to control or to connect. And realize that those things go in 
diametrically opposed directions. Do we want to communicate to uh, dominate or to relate and realize that those two things go in opposite directions? And so in all of our relationships, if we hang in them long enough, we're, there's going to be conflict. Uh, because people are individuals, and if we value another individual for the individuality, they're going to be different than us, and we from them. So the degree we value and protect each other's individualities, that's going to bring us into conflicts. And some of those conflicts are going to be in existence as long as the relationship's in existence. We get better at navigating them. We get better at steering our way through there, but they're always going to be there because we are who we are. And so if we're communicating to control rather than connect, if we're communicating to dominate rather than relate, and we come to these moments of conflict, uh, then we're going. Then our primary goal is going to be to be right. My primary goal is going to be to get you to see things the way I see things. My primary goal is going to be to get my way, rather than to connect with you, understand you, and and love you, get to know you better. And in this, there's a couple just little pointers. The first of these is always attack the issue, not the person. All right, always attack the issue, not the person. You know this, but we could all stand reminders on that. And, and again, we all know this, uh, but at least, and, and I've known this for, oh, geez, 50, 60 years, but occasionally I still lapse. And uh, no name calling. I mean, just no name calling whatsoever. Name calling is out of bounds. I was at, the, Linda and I were walking the other night, and uh, we were out by the countryside pond, uh, and there was a little boy fishing with his grandfather. The little boy cast his lure into the weeds, and the grandfather said to him, you numbskull. I, I haven't heard that word for years. <laughs> but it brought back that old numbskull word. Robbie, you numbskull. And, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, in that moment, it, the issue wasn't that the boy didn't have anything in his head. It wasn't that he wasn't a good caster yet. And it would have been a very different thing to say, you know, you could use a little more skill in your casting so you catch fish and not weeds. Let's go over here and practice a while and we'll come back. That's a very different thing than saying, you numbskull. <clears throat> I mean, those are the kind of things that stick with a person their whole life long. And pretty soon we hear ourselves saying to ourselves when we do something, Robbie, you numbskull. It shapes the very way we see ourselves. So attack issues, not words. And then keep it positive. And we live in an overwhelmingly negative age. Ours is the age of contempt. And and so to be positive, we're going we're to be swimming against the current. You know, we're going to be bucking against the tide. We're, we're going to, it, it's going to be a struggle to be positive in such a negative world. But what we know is that we know that um, negative words carry far more weight than positive words. I, I, if I asked you, I bet you have a hard time thinking of some of the positive things people said to you. But the negative things people said to you, you can tell me them almost immediately. And... And we need to say at least, at least, and this is a best case scenario, at least eight positive statements to undo the damage that any negative, that a single negative statement will make. We remember the negative stuff. And, and, and we don't recover quickly from the negative stuff. You know, we say something, it was thoughtless, it was stupid, we say, I'm sorry, we expect it to make it better. But if you thoughtlessly slam my hand in the door, or I, let's, I thoughtlessly slam your hand in the door, and I say, I'm sorry, does that make your hand better? No, it does not. You still have to go to the emergency room. It's still going to take months for the hand to heal, and your hand may never be the same. Some of the statements we make, some of the statements I've made, I remember some statements for 40 years that I said to somebody else that was cruel, over 40 years. Uh, we can be forgiven, but sometimes it never undoes the effects. So keep it positive. Keep it positive. And then, again, remember, remember that with every message, there's a meta-message. So more than our words, there are other things that convey that message. So if I say, I'm not upset. I noticed I even spit when I said that. You know, I'm not upset. Um, the words say, I'm not upset. But what is, what's my real message? I am upset, and I need you to calm me down. Right? So the real message is, I'm, this is speaking to control. I want you to do what I want. I want you to do what I want you to do. I'm out of control. The person who's out of control is not safe. So you better calm me down. How do you calm me down? By thinking like I do, by saying I'm right, by acquiescing to where I want this to go. And parents, uh, I remember when I read the book Scream Free Parenting, it was like an epiphany to me. It said that's, you know, in parenting, we all scream at kids. It's what parents do. Uh, but realize that when we're screaming at a kid, what we're saying is, I'm out of control. Calm me down. And they said, that's just not fair to a kid. I mean, that, you, you know, we're being the child. 
making the kid be the adult. That's just not fair. Uh, so again, these are all ways that we seek to control a relationship, that we can take, speak to, that we can control communication, dominate rather than connect, relate. Two very different things. But that doesn't just happen in conflict. That happens in everyday life as well. And let me just real quickly run you through how that happens in everyday life. So you say to me, Rob, how are you doing? And I say, oh, I'm good. I'm good. What do I mean by that? Well, one of the acronyms for good, well, an acronym is it, but one of the things that would, uh, good can be, uh, you can make those words uh, stand for is um, good stands for gloomy, overworked, overwhelmed, but I don't really trust you to care about it. That's good. You know, how, how am I really? I'm gloomy, I'm overworked, I'm overwhelmed, but I don't really trust you to care about it or understand or whatever. And what I do is I take control of communication right from the very start because it'd just be too painful for, for me for you to not pay any attention to me or really care about me or do the hard work of understanding why I might. And so I just take control right from the very start and don't talk about any of that. How are you? I'm good. Do I, does that bring us closer? Do we connect? No, it drives us farther apart, but it keeps me in control, keeps me invulnerable, keeps me tough. Hey, Rob, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. I can't actually tell you what fine stands for because the F is a bit problematic. Um, but but, um, <coughs> uh, but I, I've actually figured out a way to change the F. And so, uh, and so fine can stand for fully incapable of naming emotions. <laughs> Pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> fully, and it's even better with the F, but I can't really say that in here. So uh, fully incapable of naming emotions. And... Uh, uh, and, and, and so again, you ask me, I'm fine? Well, maybe I'm really sad. And the truth is, I'm sad a lot of the time. Uh, but but, but I, I don't, I'm not even necessarily aware of that myself. I, I was never trained to recognize emotions, truly. And so I don't always even know what I'm feeling, let alone be able to tell you. If I, and I sure don't want to admit to myself what I'm feeling, admit that I'm sad. That might drag me way down. I don't want to go there. And so, and so, again, to keep control of the communication so it doesn't go somewhere uncomfortable for me. How are you? I'm fine. Does it draw us closer? Do we connect? Do we relate? No, it drives us apart, but it keeps me in control. Whenever we communicate, one of the first things we have to ask ourselves, am I communicating to control or to connect? And realize they go in opposite directions. Final one. Final one is, um, uh, and this comes right from the book of James. This is the first chapter of the book of James. There's all kinds of good stuff in James. That's why I'd love for you to read the book. It's just filled with wisdom. Uh, towards the back of the Bible, you can find it in the, in the table of contents. And, in, in the, in the, um, and one thing James says is be quick to listen, be slow to speak. speak. Exactly right. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak. And this is some of the best relational advice you'll ever get. In fact, it may be the single best piece of relational advice there is. And, and, and here's the question for this, uh, for all of us on this. The question is, am I communicating, am I relating to another person out of judgment or curiosity? All right? It, am, am I communicating out of judgment or curiosity? And, and I would love for you to write this down, all right? You might be a writer downer. Some people are. Other people are not writer downers. I would love for you to write this down and think about this, okay? I'm just going to give you one little phrase. I, I, my hunch is you might not agree with this right off the bat. I heard this 25 or 30 years ago for the first time. I pushed back on it really hard. I'm still not fully convinced, um, but I've come to believe there's really something here. So I would love for you to take this phrase and decide whether or not you believe it and if it has any merit in it whatsoever. But here's a definition of judgment, all right? And this is what I'd love for you to write down. Judgment, in all its forms, whenever we make a judgment, is a tragic expression of unmet need. Okay? Judgment is a tragic expression of unmet need. So, yep, I can see some eyebrows going up. It doesn't seem to make much sense. I've pushed back on it for another year, so I'd love for you to write it down and think about it that quickly. You may never agree with it, but, but maybe it has some merit. Let, let, me, let me explain to you how this is, sort of works for me. One of the things, and, and you know, like I said, relationships to the degree that you have individuals that are different, there's gonna, those differences, who we are, those, those conflicts are going to exist throughout the time of a relationship. They're chronic. And so in a marriage, the issues you have at the start, you're going to have at the end. Nobody tells you that, but it's true. What you learn is to navigate them better, to have quicker recovery time, so on and so forth. But the issues are already there. That's not a discouragement. That means you're taking each other seriously. 
Um, and so in my marriage, one of the issues that I have had with Linda, this, this is a, and you'll see how this is a Rob issue, and this will surprise you, this will surprise you that I would, that I would say this to my, it wouldn't surprise you that I would say this to my, that I would say this to my wife, but what I say will surprise you. I will sometimes say to my wife, and I've said this from the very start for over 40 years, I'll say, Linda, you are so selfish. Now, I know, anybody who knows my wife knows she is one of the least selfish people you would ever want to meet, right? And that's just true, and I know that. But when I make this judgment, you're selfish, then for me, that judgment keeps me from listening to her, keeps me from having to talk to her, keeps me from having to open myself up. But here's the thing, um, where is, is it she's really selfish? No, what's happening? Well, this will come as a surprise to all of us, I'm sure. On occasions, Linda has an agenda that is entirely different from my agenda. <laughs> Surprising, right? I mean, an agenda that's entirely different from my agenda. Now, here is the part that is surprising. And I don't like to admit this. I truly do not like to admit this. Sometimes, that, and I just feel like a baby even saying this, sometimes that is incredibly painful for me. I mean, sometimes that just really hurts. But I'm not willing to be that vulnerable. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to admit that about myself. I don't admit that I'm that needy, that I'm that weak, that all those other sorts of things. And so rather than, and, and rather than listening to what my wife has to say and letting the conversation progress, what I'm going to do is make a judgment and shut the whole thing down. You see the difference there? That in, instead of being curious and listening and, and, and allowing the ratio, when we judge what other people, and it can be any one of a judgment, you're boring, you're stupid, you're shallow, you're reactive, you're extreme, you're crazy. Uh, you know, whatever we might say, how those judgments keep us from listening to other people, learning about other people, but they're not really a reflection of other people, they're a reflection of something in us. Something deep back a long, long time ago, it's incredibly hurtful, but we didn't get something we needed, and so we keep projecting that out into the world. We just keep projecting that out into the world. Judgments are a tragic expression of our unmet need. Try that on, try that on. And we may never vocalize the judgment, but we sure do think them. So the challenge is to be curious. Listen to one another, learn from one another, so that we might grow closer to one another. You know who did this really, really well? Jesus. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, um, and this is one of the things that's unique about Christianity. Um, but Jesus, we believe God came into the world in Jesus, and Jesus, when Jesus came into the world, was speechless. He came into the world as a baby. So he couldn't even talk, and literally. And for 30 years, before he uttered his per first public word, for 30 years, Jesus just listened. He listened to his mom. And we believe that Joseph died early on. That's why we never hear anymore about Joseph. So he listened to his mom about how hard it was to be a single mother. People called you know, her, uh, uh, they called her all kinds of bad names, uh, heard his mother talk about how painful it was when people judged her. He listened to his people talk about their pain. He worked in the workplace, heard people talk about how hard work was. He heard about life's disappointments and sorrows, its joys. And so after 30 years of listening, when Jesus spoke, people flocked to him. And what did they say? They say, you don't talk like all the religious people. You actually get us. You actually understand. Why? Because 30 years listening to just Three short years speaking. Whether we follow Jesus or not, I think there might be something to learn from that. And so our words are explosive. Our words are incendiary. They are powerful. But they can also be good. They can be words of hope, of healing, of encouragement, of inspiration, of love, of affection. May your words and mine, dear brothers, be winsome words, words of kindness, grace, love. Amen. 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 Please stand.